In this video, we are going to explore the German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche's concept of spiritual sickness. In his work, The Genealogy of Morality, Nietzsche defines this concept of spiritual illness as activities where a living being seeks to undermine the conditions of its own health and vitality. Such a spiritual sickness is most prominent within ascetic religions like Judeo-Christianity and Buddhism, where individuals try to suppress their bodily impulses or to withdraw into solitude and renounce the world. When an organism not only obstructs but deliberately hinders fundamental life processes, it can be deemed biologically sick in the most profound sense. Such a sickness, if it were ever to become widespread, as Nietzsche thinks it has in Western civilization, would pose an existential risk. While modern psychology might be critical of the idea of spiritual pathologies, it is undeniable that we are currently facing a mental health crisis. The current mental health crises might mean that the idea of spiritual sickness is more relevant than ever before. Before exploring Nietzsche's notion of spiritual illness, it is essential to gain insight into his understanding of life itself. According to Frederick Neuhauser, Nietzsche conceptualized life as a goal-directed process or series of activities aimed at attaining power. Nietzsche famously described this pursuit as the quest for ever greater units of power. He believed that life, in its pursuit of power, engages in activities that may involve inducing pain. Life operates essentially, that is in its basic functions, through injury, assault, exploitation, destruction, and simply cannot be thought of without this character. Nietzsche's description of life as a goal-directed process aimed at attaining greater units of power, might lead one to believe that he perceives it as a teleological process. However, there is a difference between having a goal and a telos. In a teleological process, there is a predetermined end that shapes the entire course of the process. The achievement of this goal brings the process to its final predestined completion. Each stage follows necessarily from the preceding one and the process can't be considered complete without passing through all these stages. However, life, according to Nietzsche, lacks a definite end or stage where the entire process finds a final satisfactory completion. Life takes on a fluid form, and it defies substantial categorization. Nietzsche envisions life existing along a continuum, where the distinction between things lies not in their essence, but in the degree to which various manifestations appear. This perspective challenges the notion of life being teleological in the Hegelian sense, emphasizing its dynamic and ever-changing nature instead. Frederick Neuhauser's interpretation of Nietzsche's claim that life seeks ever greater units of power draws analogies to Karl Marx's analysis of the capitalist accumulation of surplus value. In the realm of capitalist accumulation, the origin of surplus value, whether from luxury watches, airplanes, or shoes, becomes inconsequential. The production process can rapidly shift between markets based solely on where surplus value can be maximized at a given moment. Similarly, life's processes share a resemblance to capitalism in that it lacks a predetermined outcome. Each deviation holds no significance concerning the ultimate purpose of the process itself. In simpler terms, both life and capitalism prioritize not the intrinsic nature of things, but rather their ability to fulfill their respective objectives. Accumulating surplus value for capitalism and seeking greater power for life. This pragmatic approach drives their actions, attaching value to the attainment of specific goals rather than inherent qualities. The consequence of this continuous and open-ended process is that the Hegelian notion of completion or satisfaction, the telos, does not apply to the fundamental processes of life. In essence, life's undetermined and infinitely open-ended vital processes differ significantly from a linear transformation, like an acorn growing into an oak. The dynamic nature of life resists being confined to a predetermined end goal, setting it apart from fixed developmental processes. The idea that life is a process of overpowering and mastery holds significant implications for comprehending the origin and purpose of various things such as organs, institutions, or ethics. Life operates as a process of appropriation, 
where objects or ideas take on new purposes or functions when they are taken over by a more powerful force that exerts a transformative effect on them. In this way, life constantly reshapes and repurposes elements, be they physical or conceptual, through its relentless process of appropriation and transformation. The history of evolution is the history of various wills to power that succeed each other in determining the purpose of an organ, institution, or meaning. Form is always fluid, but meaning is even more so. The evolution of a thing, a custom, an organ, is thus by no means its progresses toward a goal, even less a logical progresses by the shortest route and with the smallest expenditure of force, but a succession of more or less profound, more or less mutually independent processes of subduing, plus the resistance they encounter, the attempts at transformation for the purpose of defense and reaction, and the results of successful counteractions. The form is fluid, but the meaning is even more so. This process of appropriation and mastery that life engages in makes it exceptionally difficult to determine the origins of various entities, whether they be organs, institutions, or customs. When an object or idea encounters a stronger will to power, it undergoes a process of assimilation and repurposing, leading to entirely different ends from its previous function. Nietzsche argues that assuming, for instance, the hand was solely created for grasping is a mistake because it might have had an entirely different purpose initially. In reality, a more dominant will to power takes control over something less powerful, integrating it into a new unity and giving it a completely new purpose. This process of appropriation and transformation lies at the heart of Nietzsche's perspective on the dynamic and evolutionary nature of life. Life's pursuit of ever greater units of power consists of this process of appropriation and integration, where objects or ideas are continually imbued with new meaning and purpose. This hierarchical organization allows higher or nobler functions to dominate lower ones, leading to perfection and mastery. Living beings form purposeful wholes, where specialized functions collaborate for the overall benefit of the whole, and each element is configured into an organic unity. While self-preservation plays a role in increasing power, the primary goal of life is perfection and mastery, ultimately leading to greater dominance. This is what Nietzsche means by the statement that life seeks ever greater units of power. The pursuit of ever greater units of power involves a process of hierarchy, interpretation, and organization that drives constant growth and self-overcoming, ultimately leading to increased power. Another crucial aspect Nietzsche attributes to life is interpretation. The evaluative and interpretive activity of living organisms including the imposition of meaning and form on the intrinsically meaningless, is equally vital in the pursuit of greater power. Every happening in the organic world is an overpowering, a mastering, and every overpowering and mastering is itself a reinterpreting, a fitting into place, in which previous meaning and purpose must be obscured or completely extinguished. Life processes involve acts of overpowering and domination, where the assertion of power leads to a transformation in the meanings and purposes of the entities being overpowered. As Neuhauser explains, quote, to change the meaning or purpose of something is to reinterpret it, which in the broadest sense refers to the ordering of something present, something that has somehow come to be into a system of purposes, unquote. In essence, Interpretation involves imposing new purposes on what initially exists passively, incorporating it into a system of purposeful activities that then collaborate to serve the overall purpose of the organism as a whole. All purposes are signs that a will to power has become master of something less powerful and imposed upon it the meaning of a function. What Nietzsche is saying is that life's pursuit of power involves a process of imposing organic order on seemingly insignificant matter, giving it value only in relation to the ordered whole where it assumes a specific role. Life, in essence, attributes meaning to the intrinsically meaningless, also giving it an aesthetic quality as it drives for greater and more complex organization and unity. Consequently, beauty emerges unintentionally as a result of this transformative process, and the interpretive nature of beauty, 
intertwines it with the dynamics of life. This complexity and diversification makes beauty a constitutive element of life. Nietzsche's conception of life was profoundly shaped by Darwin's influence. If evolution is a central function of life, living beings must possess the ability to adopt random physical forms. These forms then serve their vital functions within an established but adaptable organic unity, allowing life to continuously evolve and flourish. This inherent flexibility empowers life's pursuit of power and progress. Nietzsche's utilization of the Darwinian hypothesis leads him to emphasize that the species is the primary unit of life, rather than focusing on individuals. Vital functions exhibited by individuals can only be fully understood through the lens of species-level processes as evolution occurs at the level of the species, not within isolated individuals. Contrary to the individualistic stance often attributed to him, Nietzsche regards life fundamentally as the life of the species. Strengthening the human species is a prerequisite for producing stronger individuals. While greatness may manifest predominantly in individuals, they are in essence beneficiaries of cultural accomplishments and can only attain greatness within a cultural context. Now that we comprehend Nietzsche's understanding of the nature of life, we can approach from a biological perspective the concepts of health and sickness in living beings. At the individual level, health entails the smooth execution of life's processes, involving the establishment of order and the creation of greater units of power. This dynamic process enables the discharge of ever-increasing energy through activity. In a healthy organism that is in complete harmony with its own nature, the coordinated activity of the instincts, drives, and affects is directed towards growth, expansion, enhancement, and constant self-overcoming. Even when this means, under certain circumstances, putting self-preservation at risk. Biologically, health is synonymous with vitality. A state of flourishing, rich, self-overflowing, characterized by powerful physicality and strong, free, cheerful activity emanating from a profound sense of plenitude, strength, and the will to live. This robust vitality finds embodiment in the warrior, and its sexual connotations are obvious because sexuality serves as a sign of vitality. On the contrary, illness refers to a persistent and premature disruption of life's processes, involving mere repetitions of the same processes with sluggish and inconsistent renewal, leading to a depletion of energy. Sickness embodies characteristics opposite to those of health. Powerlessness, passivity, heaviness, and notably the inability to impose order or meaning on encountered facts or events. The concept of illness viewed solely through biological lenses does not adequately encompass the uniquely human aspect or spiritual illness that Nietzsche is interested in. To grasp spiritual sickness, we need a perspective that goes beyond mere animal phenomena while still acknowledging the relevance of life-related aspects rather than focusing solely on spiritual phenomena. Nietzsche's viewpoint on spirit complements his perspective on life, which we've already explored. There exists a fundamental distinction between spiritual beings and mere animals, which consists of a self-reflexive, internal division that is characteristic of human beings. Self-reflexivity refers to a process that is directed backwards upon an individual, like the pain from a guilty conscience. Guilt is a self-reflexive process. The self-reflexive internal division which characterizes human beings emerges when we combine the concepts of life and subjectivity into one, giving rise to what Nietzsche defines as spirit. In other words, spirit is not an entirely separate or opposing dimension to life, but rather a heightened expression of life processes in a more refined form. Life and spirit are interconnected as one continuous process. What elevates life into spirit is nothing more than a more advanced and intricate organization of a living organism. A development that arises from life processes themselves and is not beyond them. Moreover, spirit comes about when these processes are deflected from their original purposes and repressed. As Nietzsche describes it, spirit is life turned back against itself. 
This division originated due to societal pressures that disrupted the natural flow of instinctual energy. In Beyond Good and Evil, Nietzsche implies that our base instincts are connected to our spirituality. The degree and kind of a man's sexuality reach up into the ultimate pinnacle of his spirit. How does life, turned back against itself, lead to something higher than life? Nietzsche discovers the answer to this question in what he terms the bad conscience. Nietzsche draws a clear distinction between the purely animal and the human when discussing the origin of the bad conscience. As humans embrace social living, they encounter the need to suppress and devalue their instincts. This suppression of instinctual behavior creates an internal division, leading individuals to be at odds with their own nature. Nietzsche identifies the main cause of this internal conflict as the repression and redirection of instincts, especially the instincts of freedom. Such repression gives rise to a fundamental human drive for freedom, an intense longing to express instincts and desires freely, a yearning that has existed since the beginning of humanity. Nietzsche traced the origin of the bad conscience to the repression of the instinct of cruelty. The bite of conscience, as it is sometimes called, is cruelty turned inward according to Nietzsche. This inward-turning instinct of cruelty is essentially a physiological disposition to release energy in a certain direction. Nietzsche describes the bad conscience as the moment when an interpretation is attached to this disposition to inflict pain on oneself, imbuing it with meaning. For example, according to Nietzsche, guilt initially revolved around social obligations, particularly debts owed to fellow members, ancestors, or deities of a tribe. These social obligations, especially debts, provided a means to discharge the pent-up energy arising from the instinct of cruelty, thus giving rise to the bad conscience. The simplest example of interpretation joining with the disposition to inflict cruelty on oneself to yield the bad conscience is when that instinct latches on to an already present concept, debt, and uses it to give a meaning to action that serves as an outlet for its pent-up energy. Human beings have evolved to thrive in the wilderness, engaging in war, prowling, and adventure. Suddenly, all these instincts were devalued and put on hold when our ancestors were confined within societal boundaries. These destructive instincts had to be repressed as our ancestors entered the walls of society. Taming a cruel animal requires the use of cruelty itself, and to prevent this caged animal from wreaking havoc in the community, strict punishments were established. Nietzsche says the conscience was instituted by acts of violence, but also carried to its conclusion by acts of violence. This internalization and accumulation of instinctual energy is also responsible for the origins of the soul. As human instincts were repressed and redirected, the complex interplay of these energies laid the foundation for the development of the soul. All instincts that do not discharge themselves outwardly turn inward. This is what I call the internalization of man. Thus, it was that man first developed what was later called his soul. The human soul is a product of the complex internal organization resulting from the accumulation of repressed instinctual energy, which is what distinguishes humans from mere animals. Nietzsche explains how the soul came to be as the instincts of freedom were banished from sight and compelled to turn inward upon the possessors of those instincts. It was under these conditions that the human soul gradually took shape and evolved. The entire inner world, originally as thin as if it were stretched between two membranes, expanded and extended itself, acquired depth, breadth, and height in the same measure as outward discharge was inhibited. Those fearful bulwarks with which the political organization protected itself against the old instincts of freedom, punishment belongs among these bulwarks, brought about that all those instincts of wild, free, prowling man turn back against the possessors of such instincts. That is the origin of the bad conscience. The key point here is that the soul and spirit are not separate from life as a higher order of being. Rather, they are deeply rooted within the basic organic processes of our animal physiology. This is how Nietzsche explains how humans transitioned from mere animals to beings with a soul, and eventually to spiritual beings. He suggests that the repression of instincts contributes to the origins of the soul, 
but our spirituality emerges as a consequence of the self-reflexive internal division that characterizes human beings, especially the division caused by the bad conscience. Basically, our spirituality is dependent on the ability to be internally divided against ourselves. The bad conscience originally puts human beings at odds with their own nature. Merely internalized instincts, while being responsible for the creation of the soul, would not be enough to create spirituality. According to Nietzsche, the most decisive mark of a spiritual nature is being internally divided against oneself and being a battleground of opposites. This internal division shapes the conditions of spirituality in human beings. We consciously remain unaware of our instinctual functions and the purposes they serve. When these instincts are repressed and find no outward expression, they become distorted, making it challenging for us to recognize the desires they serve consciously. Freudian psychoanalysis was built upon Nietzsche's observations regarding the consequences of repressed instincts and the pathological conditions that this may lead to. It is impossible to overlook the extent to which civilization is built upon renunciation of instinct. Under the impact of these new conditions, human beings became vulnerable to spiritual illnesses that are unknown to other animals. However, these same conditions also opened up the possibility for higher states of spirituality, which we will explore later. Before that, we need to know what makes the bad conscience an illness. Nietzsche attributes the origin of the bad conscience to the effects of the repressed instinct of cruelty within individuals. This repression leads to a state of misery-laden discontent, arising from the inability to release the pent-up instinctual energy. I regard the bad conscience as the serious illness that man was bound to contract under the stress of the most fundamental change he ever experienced. That change which occurred when he found himself finally enclosed within the walls of society and peace. This state of repressed or inhibited vitality is considered a sickness, but not yet a spiritual sickness in Nietzsche's view. In its early primitive form, the original bad conscience, although a sickness, does not qualify as a spiritual sickness. To be classified as a spiritual sickness, the state of the soul must involve the combination of interpretation and reflexivity resulting in actions that hinder life's fundamental aim of accumulating ever greater units of power by giving form to the formless and through the discharge of instinctual energy. This spiritual illness goes beyond being a mere consequence of external pressures. It becomes an intentional and willed state. The spiritually ill individual actively seeks to suppress their own instincts and may resort to self-cruelty as a means of achieving this. The guilt and pain experienced by this sick person are considered evidence of their intrinsic unworthiness, reinforcing the need to repress their instincts. In other words, spiritual sickness involves an internal struggle and a purposeful repression of one's own vital impulses, leading to actions and feelings that thwart the pursuit of greater power and vitality. A spiritually ill being has an internally divided soul where one part, making use of concepts that interpret and evaluate, takes sides against the other in a way that impedes the external discharge of instinctual energy. In more concrete terms, society's rules and norms prohibit the expression of certain instincts, such as sexuality, cruelty, or even freedom. This produces within the individual an accumulation of pent-up instinctual energy. Once the bad conscience is combined with an interpretation for this pain, there is opened up within the soul a division between instincts labeled as bad and therefore forbidden or repressed, and those seen as good. The term self-reflexivity refers to this internal struggle, a state where an organism actively takes sides against itself. This is a condition that Nietzsche associates with Christianity. The bad conscience in its later phase, like the one Nietzsche associates with Christianity, comes about when an interpretation like sinfulness is added to this suffering. Then it becomes a spiritual sickness. For instance, Freud observed that as one tends to become more virtuous, they may experience increased guilt, which exemplifies the pathological form the bad conscience can take. For the more virtuous a man is, the more severe and distrustful is its behavior, so that ultimately it is precisely those people who have carried saintliness furthest who reproach themselves with the worst sinfulness.
For Nietzsche, spiritual health consists of two interconnected aspects, the affirmation of self and the affirmation of life. He criticized what he called disinterested or unegoistic actions, such as pity, self-abnegation, and self-sacrifice, since they lead one to say no to life and to themselves, similar to how Schopenhauer did. The inability to affirm oneself is the root cause of the severe form of the sickness Nietzsche calls the bad conscience, prevalent in his time. A prime example of this can be observed within the environmentalist movement today, where human beings are often portrayed as an abomination that solely exploits and destroys. This sentiment has become pervasive in contemporary society, even being embraced as a moral standpoint. What gives this movement its appeal is not just the moralizing but also the pathological guilt that is naturally associated with it. The darkening sky above mankind has deepened in step with the increase in man's feeling of shame at man. This attitude described by Nietzsche reflects the spiritual pathology prevalent in modern society. To address this issue, one potential remedy involves consciously affirming oneself. Rather than succumbing to reflexive guilt and shame, Nietzsche advocates for embracing reflexive affirmation as a fundamental aspect of spirituality. A good example of this self-reflexive affirmation can be found in God's affirmation of his own creation on the sixth day in Genesis. God looked over all he had made, and he saw that it was good. The process of reflexive self-affirmation entails transcending oneself and adopting a self-reflective perspective, where one becomes the object of their own valuing gaze. This active valuing involves concepts of good and bad. Through this reflexive evaluation, individuals hold the potential to take responsibility for their own values. To reflexively affirm oneself and to recognize personal accountability for this affirmative self-evaluation is the core of spiritual health. Embracing this approach empowers individuals to cultivate a positive and constructive outlook on themselves and their values, contributing to overall well-being and spiritual growth. To step momentarily outside one's engagement in the world and to look back at oneself and what one has done and to find what one encounters good, these are the constitutive moments of spiritually affirming of saying yes to one's own being. Nietzsche envisioned this affirmative stance becoming a matter of conscience. It is made possible by the extensive historical development of the bad conscience, which he also sees as the history of responsibility. Ultimately, the spiritually healthy and autonomous individual emerges as the late fruit of this historical development. In making this connection, Nietzsche establishes a significant link between conscience and the right to affirm oneself positively. It is easy to guess the concept of conscience that we here encounter in its highest, almost astonishing manifestation has a long history and variety of forms behind it. To possess the right to stand security for oneself and to do so with pride, thus to possess also the right to affirm oneself. This, as has been said, is a ripe fruit, but also a late fruit. How long must this fruit have hung on the tree, unripe and sour? Nietzsche views the bad conscience as a profound and transformative illness that has deeply affected humanity. Instead of lamenting the past, Nietzsche sees the potential in this sickness. He regards it as the very condition that paves the way for humanity's highest spirituality and the possibility of transcending its present state. He calls it a sickness like pregnancy is a sickness. With it mankind became a great promise, pregnant with a future. The existence on earth of an animal soul turned against itself, taking sides against itself, was something so new, profound, unheard of, enigmatic, contradictory, and pregnant with a future that the aspect of the earth was essentially altered. Indeed, divine spectators were needed to do justice to the spectacle that thus began, and the end of which is not yet in sight. A spectacle too subtle, too marvelous, too paradoxical to be played senselessly, unobserved on some ludicrous planet. From now on, man is included among the most unexpected and exciting lucky throws in the dice game of Heraclitus' great child, be called Zeus or Chance. He gives rise to an interest, a tension, a hope, almost a certainty. As if with him, something were announcing and preparing itself, as if man were not a goal but only a way. An episode, 
a bridge, a great promise. Nietzsche did not see the internal division characteristic of human beings as inherently negative. Within it lies both great danger and immense possibilities. This phenomenon is a sickness, but its level of pathology varies. There are four distinct features of the bad conscience that contribute to its pathological nature. Nietzsche aimed to differentiate gradations of spiritual illness, and comprehending these aspects is crucial for a coherent understanding of his remarks about the bad conscience. We will examine each of these features in the order of their significance in terms of pathology, starting with the first and least pathological. Nietzsche's analysis of these features of spiritual pathology focuses on Christianity and the ascetic ideal and for good reason. When Nietzsche speaks of the ascetic ideals, he means values that advocate withdrawing, abstaining, or rejecting bodily, emotional, and material aspects of everyday life. Nietzsche says the Christian motto of poverty, chastity, humility is an ascetic ideal because it suggests that people need to abstain from material wealth, sensual urges, and emotional or egotistical feelings. The ascetic ideal and Christianity have driven humanity's spiritual sickness to its highest pitch with the notion of guilt before God. You will have guessed what has really happened here, beneath all this, that will to self-tormenting, that repressed cruelty of the animal man made inward and scarred back into himself, the creature imprisoned in the state so as to be tamed, who invented the bad conscience in order to hurt himself after the more natural vent for this desire to hurt had been blocked. This man of the bad conscience has seized upon the presupposition of religion so as to drive his self-torture to its most gruesome pitch of severity and rigor. Guilt before God. According to Nietzsche scholar Frederick Neuhauser, the reason this unquenchable thirst for pain is considered pathological is not entirely clear, because Nietzsche views suffering as a normal and essential aspect of life. Neuhauser suggests that the Christian perspective on suffering may be considered pathological, not only because the sufferer is the cause of their own pain, but also due to actively seeking it out, craving more pain. During the Middle Ages, there were movements where people would congregate and publicly engage in self-flagellation, whipping themselves until they bled, all while singing hymns. Nietzsche referred to this state of affairs as the kingdom of the ascetic priest. This ancient mighty sorcerer in his struggle with displeasure, the ascetic priest, he had obviously won, his kingdom has come. One no longer protested against pain, one thirsted for pain. More pain, more pain! The desire of his disciple and initiates has cried for centuries. In my analysis, the Christian's thirst for pain is deemed pathological not only because they seek their own suffering, but also because they interpret their suffering as evidence of their unworthiness and sinfulness. This yearning for pain becomes a means of self-negation, which contributes to its pathological nature. Seeking pain on its own cannot be classified as pathological as spiritually healthy individuals may welcome their own suffering. The key lies in the interpretation applied to this self-inflicted pain. The extent to which an unending desire for pain becomes a spiritual illness depends on the meaning attributed to this pain and whether it serves life's functions, allowing one to impose limits and measure on this self-inflicted pain. Nietzsche argues that the self-torture associated with Christianity and the ascetic ideal lacks this measure, and does not align with life's overall aims, making it pathological. In the genealogy, he suggests that the Christian interprets this self-denial as if it were the will of God. Guilt before God. This thought becomes an instrument of torture to him. He apprehends in God the ultimate antithesis of his own ineluctable instincts. He misinterprets these animal instincts themselves as a form of guilt before God, as hostility, rebellion, insurrection against the Lord, the Father, the primal ancestor and origin of the world. He stretches himself upon the contradiction God and devil. He ejects from himself all his denial of himself, of his nature, naturalness and actuality, in the form of an affirmation as something existent, corporeal, real, as God, as the holiness of God, as God the judge, as God the hangman, as the beyond, as eternity, as torment without end, as hell, as the immeasurability of punishments and guilt. 
The second pathological feature of the Christian bad conscience is its mendaciousness or falseness. Nietzsche defines this mendaciousness as a motivated ignorance of oneself, achieved by repressing the underlying instinctual motives behind one's actions and attitudes. This willful ignorance alone is not sufficient to be classified as a spiritual illness, as ignorance of oneself can coexist with vitality. It must be combined with other elements to achieve a state of pathology. In this scenario, the Christian is not truthful with himself regarding his own nature. His bad conscience arises as a result of sin, and he employs his feelings of guilt before God to fuel his self-torment, leading to a negation of his instincts rather than their mastery. The Christian is unable to affirm himself without the distorted lens of repression and self-deception. If self-deception is an aspect of spiritual sickness, conscious self-transparency becomes a vital component of spiritual health. A genuine, undistorted view of ourselves and our desires one that involves self-revelation, is more fitting for self-conscious beings than self-opacity. Embracing self-awareness and being transparent with ourselves about who we are and what we truly want fosters spiritual well-being and personal growth. The third characteristic of the bad conscience that renders it a spiritual illness is the inability for self-affirmation. The spiritually unwell individual denies themselves and in doing so reveals a deep aversion to life rooted in shame for being human. Self-denial and the incapacity to take pride in oneself, unless viewed through the distorted lens of repression, are closely linked to self-hatred and self-contempt. This type of self-denial is also accompanied by a broader denial of life, evident in the behavior of the ascetic priest. The idea at issue here is the valuation the ascetic priest places on our life. He juxtaposes it, along with what pertains to it, nature, world, the whole sphere of becoming and transitoriness, with quite a different mode of existence which it opposes and excludes, unless it turn against itself, deny itself. In that case, the case of the ascetic life, life counts as a bridge to that other mode of existence. In this particular form of self-denial, the value of worldly activity, in the only world we know, is solely perceived as a means to attain another existence beyond this world a supposedly higher yet illusory realm that contradicts the essence of this life and world. While one might be tempted to view this as the most extreme form of spiritual illness, Nietzsche does not think so. Despite his criticism of the ascetic ideal and its negative assessment of life and the world, Nietzsche perceives it as a stimulus for life. Its recurring presence in various cultures and throughout time suggests that the ascetic ideal must serve a significant purpose for life. Consider how regularly and universally the ascetic appears in every age. He belongs to no one race. He prospers everywhere. He emerges from every class of society. Nor does he breed and propagate his mode of valuation through heredity. The opposite is the case. Broadly speaking, a profound instinct rather forbids him to propagate. It must be a necessity of the first order that again and again promotes the growth and prosperity of this life inimical species. It must indeed be in the interest of life itself that such a self-contradictory type does not die out. For an ascetic life is a self-contradiction. The enduring presence of the ascetic ideal throughout history implies that, in some paradoxical and dangerous manner, it serves the interests of life, even if in a twisted way. Despite harboring hostility toward life within its valuations, the ascetic ideal remains a potent concept capable of stimulating the fundamental function of life, world-ordering activity. In the third essay of the genealogy, Nietzsche says that Christianity remarkably achieved this world-ordering function by attributing meaning to human suffering and inspiring passionate engagement in a world that it disparaged. Therefore, despite its ultimate denial of life, Christianity's world-ordering activity and the values it propagated demonstrated a vital force as the will to nothingness is still a form of will. Even in its most vital manifestation, the ascetic ideal serves as a potent stimulus to life. However, according to Neuhauser, it remains classified as a spiritual illness due to its boundless thirst for suffering, self-deception, and denial of life and the world. The fourth and final crucial feature distinguishes the ascetic ideal as the most acute form of spiritual illness, epitomized by Christianity, is itself undermining nature. 
Nietzsche refers to this as the great danger inherent in the ascetic ideal, a perilous dynamic that nourishes and sustains it. As a result, the ascetic priest grows stronger and more triumphant as his own physiological capacity diminishes. For an ascetic life is a self-contradiction. Here rules a resentment without equal that of an insatiable instinct and power will that wants to become master, not over something in life but over life itself, over its most profound, powerful, and basic conditions. Here an attempt is made to employ force to block up the wells of force. Here physiological well-being itself is viewed askance, and especially the outward expression of this well-being, beauty, and joy. While pleasure is felt and sought in ill-constitutedness, decay, pain, mischance, ugliness, voluntary deprivation, self-mortification, self-flagellation, self-sacrifice. All this is in the highest degree paradoxical. We stand before a discord that wants to be discordant, that enjoys itself in this suffering, and even grows more self-confident and triumphant the more its own presupposition, its physiological capacity for life, decreases. Despite its ability to stimulate life, the ascetic ideal has a self-defeating nature which seeks to obstruct its own vital forces. Paradoxically, while embodying vitality, it also seeks to undermine the very conditions that sustain its vitality. This self-undermining dynamic led Nietzsche to consider both the ascetic ideal and Christianity at their peak as the epitome of spiritual sickness. Beyond mere spiritual illness, these phenomena pose a significant danger. Achieving their ultimate goal could lead to the extinction of humanity. Nietzsche perceives an impending extreme form of spiritual sickness, nihilism in its most destructive manifestation, on the horizon of European culture should our current trajectory persist. The death of God, signifying the demise of the Christian values that once provided its vitality, represents one aspect of this process. The ultimate consequence of the ascetic ideal, where human beings lose all will, presents a more severe affront to life than the paradoxical will to nothingness found within the ascetic ideal itself. The loss of all values that represent vitality is the ultimate danger of the death of God. Nietzsche's perspective on the ascetic ideal doesn't conclude here. Surprisingly, he recognizes within it the groundwork for spiritual health and the potential for reaching the highest forms of spirituality. The two opposing values, good and bad, good and evil, have been engaged in a fearful struggle on earth for thousands of years. And though the latter value has certainly been on top for a long time, there are still places where the struggle is as yet undecided. One might even say it has risen ever higher, and thus become more and more profound and spiritual. So that today there is perhaps no more decisive mark of a higher nature, a more spiritual nature, than that of being divided in this sense and a genuine battleground of these opposed values. To be a spiritual being, one must grapple with internal divisions, and become a battleground of opposing forces. In Nietzsche's framework, the ascetic ideal appears to foster humanity's self-transcendence, albeit differently than the ascetic priest envisions. It can facilitate spiritual growth and transformation, as long as it avoids the pathological form seen in Christianity. While it poses great danger to humanity, it also holds immense promise. The internal division, the tension of opposites, provides the conditions for a refined and elevated spirituality. The highest form of spirituality isn't achieved by eradicating resistance and opposition, but by embracing the tension of opposites, enduring, and affirming oneself in the process. The state of spiritual health, termed great health by Nietzsche, arises from humanity's confrontation with spiritual illness. This condition entails overcoming one's sickness and emerging strengthened through the process. Therefore, this indispensable sickness paves the way for attaining true spiritual well-being. Finally, the great question would still remain whether we can really dispense with illness, even for the sake of our virtue, and whether our thirst for knowledge and self-knowledge in particular does not require the sick soul as much as the healthy, and whether, in brief, the will to health alone is not a prejudice, cowardice, and perhaps a bit of very subtle barbarism and backwardness. The spiritually healthy individual differs from the spiritually ill 
by their ability to confront and embrace the internal conflicts they face. They don't attempt to negate any part of themselves or deceive themselves about their true motives. On the other hand, the spiritually ill person sees God as the antithesis of themselves and uses their guilt before God to drive themselves towards self-torture, deepening their sense of unworthiness. So despite Nietzsche's critique of the ascetic ideal, he recognizes a potential positive aspect within it. We have seen how a certain asceticism, a severe and cheerful continence with the best will, belongs to the most favorable conditions of supreme spirituality, and is also among its most natural consequences. According to Nietzsche, those who seek an end to the inner conflict have grown weary of life. Religions like Christianity represent an exhaustion with life because they offer the promise of a future free of conflict. In contrast, the spiritually healthy person views the inner struggle as an additional stimulus for life, embracing it rather than trying to suppress it. This holds good for all those well-constituted joyful mortals who are far from regarding their unstable equilibrium between animal and angel as necessarily an argument against existence. The subtlest and brightest among them have even found in it one more stimulus to life. Christianity's introduction of opposite values and self-conceptions in human beings opened the door to great spiritual health. It involves affirming oneself in the world, fueled by the love for self-division and the ability to hold opposites together without eradicating their opposition. This capacity for self-bifurcation is far from natural, but it arises from the extreme illness that gives rise to the form of spiritual health it makes possible. Nietzsche was not one to lament things that he could not control. Instead, he sought to make the most of them, which is consistent with his affirmative philosophy. In this sickness, Nietzsche saw the very preconditions necessary for humanity's highest self-examination and offered the opportunity for great spiritual transformations. Nietzsche's model of great health and revaluation of values is similar in principle to Jung's integrative model of psychological wholeness. Nietzsche was not attempting to exclude parts of our being, but instead to evoke a transmutation of adversities into sources of strength and growth. 